how does one discern the difference between <clears throat> which laws in the lens of Christ, and thank you for that lens metaphor, myself for, that, for the word I wanted to use during the introduction, Christ clarifies the Old Testament law, right? He mm -hmm. clarifies it. Mm -hmm. That's what lenses do, they clarify for mm -hmm. us. So he clarifies the Old Testament law, but how does one discern the difference between what is transformed, what is maintained, what is extended, and what is annulled? You've got examples there, but for those four, I'm reading Old Testament laws, mm -hmm. how do I discern when one is to be treated one way or another? Yeah, that's such an important question, and it's not easily answered. We have to go to the New Testament. This is how I, I go about it. I go to the New Testament, and I begin to assess, okay, here's an Old Testament law that the New Testament authors are handling, and I say, how did they do it? What are they doing, and why are they doing it the way that they are? And then I'm able to say, now, is this other law comparable to that law? Because we don't see the New Testament authors handling all the Old Testament laws, but it appears to me that they believe all of them still matter for believers, but only in light of what Jesus has done. And so we have to do work like thinking about, okay, I know that um, the food laws, that I'm allowed to eat bacon, I, I know I can do that, so what was it about the food laws that would allow them to be annulled. What else do I know is annulled? Well, I know that sacrifice is annulled. Is there a connection between those two? What about um, the instructions about the temple building process or the priestly garments? Are they in some way all related to Israel's pageantry, their symbolic world and how it pointed to a greater reality? Remember in Exodus 24, when God came down um, to Moses on Mount Sinai, he showed him a vision and he said, build on earth after the pattern that I show you. So there's a pattern in the heavenlies of a great temple. What's on earth? And that suggests that even Moses understood that if the shadow were to give rise to substance, that the shadow would become obsolescent. That, that the associated with the temple worship was it's a picture of a greater reality that was happening in heaven. And the book of Hebrews meditates on that and identifies, even using that language, without hands in the heavenlies. That's where Jesus went, not to anything on earth. And so we begin to build connections and assess law by law. And, and consider, is this one that is transformed or is it maintained? Is it annulled or is it extended? Thank you. Go, go. Dr. Roshi, um, let's do a few case studies. So okay. We can understand this with specific laws. Okay. So Deuteronomy 22.5 says, A woman shall not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak, for whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. How do we understand that through the lens of Christ? Okay, Deuteronomy 22.5, we've got a law against cross-dressing. What's at stake, though, in this law in Deuteronomy 22 appears to be gender identification. What's at stake is we don't want confusion people as to whether you're a guy or whether you're a gal. And when we say, why would Moses have been concerned about this? It probably has something to do with Genesis chapter 2. That foundational to all of reality are gender distinctions. Genesis 1 tells us guy and gal equal in their ability to image God, equal in their ability to relate with God, equally called to fill the earth, multiply and subdue it. But even right there, the way that they will fill and multiply, they'll have a different role. And Genesis 2 then goes out of its way to identify how Adam was created first, and he becomes a head, and then he's given a helper. But he bears primary responsibility. This seems to stand behind Genesis 22.5. So then, okay, I'm getting a sense for what the law meant in its original context. Now I say, what does Jesus do? And 
when I look at the person of Jesus and how he relates to men and to women, I see him strongly affirming women, going out of his way to bless women, and yet ever recognizing that they're women and not men. And when it comes to the rest of the New Testament, I see strong affirmation of gender distinction, a deep conviction that gender identity should align with sexual makeup. And so when I'm coming to the New Testament, I'm seeing, what I'm seeing is affirmation of the principle that stands behind the Old Testament in the realm of maintenance rather than transformation or annulling or extending. The, the way that the Old Testament talks about gender identity and distinction is similar to the way the New Testament talks about gender identity and distinction. And so all of a sudden it seems to me that, that in fact, of all statements in the entire Bible with respect to transgenderism becomes a very profitable, useful, and legitimate text for Christians to use in our counseling, in shaping the parenting mindset of, of how we're to raise up boys to be strong boys and girls to be godly girls. So, so that's the type of framework. I, would be, I think about what did it mean back then, and then what do I know about the person and work of Jesus in relation to the things associated with that law, and then how do we see the, new, the rest of the New Testament building upon the teachings of Jesus and that gives me a, a better understanding of where in the lens of Christ that Mosaic law would fit so that I can appropriate it rightly in the law of Christ. So then how do we understand if we're looking at just a law in the Old Testament, whether we should transform, maintain, extend it, or know it through the law of Christ? Are there other, are there tools we can use to know which one fits into which category? Uh, with respect to, I mean, that, that relates to Brother Nick's state, or first question. We can begin to group certain laws together, but I, I don't find it, we just have to be careful there, but there certainly are certain laws that are more ceremonial or um, symbolic. And Jesus seems to be handling it in a certain way. There's, um, and so I, I, could, I could group those together. Uh, other laws, though, I am being, I, you know, you're, you're just having to take law by law and associate it with how is the New Testament authors, how are they applying such things. I don't have a, a sound principle for every single law Every single one, devotions. I'm pausing, and I'm, okay, what do I know that Jesus has done? Yes, how that law me as a believer. This. Can I give another case study? Yep. Deuteronomy 22, 22. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die, the man who lay with the woman and the woman. So you shall purge the evil from Israel. Yeah. So, purge the evil from their midst. That statement right there occurs seven times in Deuteronomy. And Paul quotes it in 1 Corinthians 5 at the end of the church discipline text. So, whoa, he's taking a capital punishment text from the Old Testament. He's not throwing it out. He's actually applying it into the church discipline context. But he's not calling the church to knock off the man who is sleeping with his mother-in-law. So he's appropriating it, but something about the coming of Christ has, has transformed that law so that it's, it's not being maintained in the same way. It's not being annulled. Paul's saying, Moses said it, and we need to apply it. Purge the evil from your midst. That's the commandment. And yet, he's seeing church discipline as an effective and authentic spiritual cutting off as if we're declaring this person is acting like a dead man. 
He's not alive in Christ. He's acting as if he's dead, and I'm going to use that Old Testament law as the pointer to the more ultimate death, and that's what we're associating with him with. He is under the wrath of God. And yet, in the coming of Christ, all of a sudden there is cast him out to Satan in order that his soul might be saved. That's the ultimate goal, and that's made possible only in and through Jesus. Not only that, we would have to account for the fact that I don't want to step on too many toes, but I would discourage putting an American flag from uh, off uh, on the stage at a Christian at a Christian uh, gathering. Christians can be patriotic, but the church is not associated with any nation. It used to be. That's one thing that Jesus has done. There was a time where there was a theocracy, a single nation under God, in covenant with Him. But the United States has never been in covenant with God. It was a distinct time in history. Jesus has come, and now Jesus is, He, he has be, represented the nation, but not only did He come to save the nation, He came to save those outside of that nation. And there is one new man. He's broken down the barrier. And all of a, sudden, a law that applied to a certain people wherein the, if, if we could call it the gathered community, covenant community, was also the state. In Christ, the state and the covenant community are now separated. For a time, the day will come when King Jesus will return to the throne and he will rule this political entity called the kingdom. But right now, we're, the church has this covenant relationship, but all the rest of the nations are in the covenant of creation and outside of that. And so that, I think, is also impacting how Paul refer, uh, would appropriate Deuteronomy 22, or 22, 22, or whatever. Just one more case study example. Sure. And there's a number of Old Testament texts that speak of creation care. This is one of them. So Deuteronomy 22.6, If you come across a bird's nest in any tree or on the ground with young ones or eggs, and the mother sitting on the young or on the eggs, you shall not take the mother with the young. You shall let the mother go, but the young you may take for yourself, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long. Okay. So you're walking through the woods and you see a bird's nest with eggs in it. The, many have written that this is a creation care text. Care for the birds. Well, you're really only caring for the mother. You can enjoy your omelet. Just don't knock out the mother. <laughs> this is a love of neighbor text, not a hu tree hugger text. <laughs> this is about living long in the land. Why do you mother and the young because you care about the next generation of neighbors who are going to need to live in this land. And if you consume all the earthly resources that God has given, remember this is the context wherein we are to image God. This is about Him, not about us. We are to fill the earth with His image. The point of the image is what you're imaging. And if we cut off the resources that allow us from generation to generation to image God, we are not loving our neighbor, nor are we loving God. So my understanding is, enjoy your omelet as a gift from God. Use the resources, but do so in balance in such a way that is still thinking about the next generation. And in doing so, you will enjoy long life. The entire community will be blessed. Final question. Yeah. What does a Christian or a pastor lose if they ignore reading through or preaching on Old Testament laws? I'll answer that first in the scary way. In Ephesians chapter 20, Paul is talking to the Ephesian elders and he said, I did not hesitate to proclaim to you the whole counsel of God. And therefore, because I did not hesitate, I will not be guilty of your blood. It's a very scary thing to say I'm going to preach some of the Bible and not all of the Bible. All of God's purposes, some of which included the Old Covenant law, 
And Paul says, this sacred writing is able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. That this scripture is given by God to teach and rebuke and correct and train. That our counseling ministry and our preaching ministry is supposed to benefit from the initial three-fourths of the Bible. But never are we to do, do our reading, our reappropriating apart from Jesus. So, we uh, could potentially cause the death of certain people or ourselves if we fail to use Moses' law like Jesus called us to do it. And we fail to have an opportunity to magnify the person that Jesus is for us in embodying our righteousness. That would be the second thing. We miss the opportunity to magnify and celebrate, to see and to savor Jesus increasingly in our own personal devotion time. If we just, oh, this is Leviticus. Let's move on. The narrative starts up in, in numbers again. It's just jump over. Um, I'm going to just really quickly build on um, something that was said. Yes, this book, it's a chapter on Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and you can learn some there. But even more than that, in my book, How to Understand and Apply the Old Testament, the last chapter has like 40 pages devoted to the Christian and Old Testament law. And if all you want is that little part, feel free to email me and I can PDF that. But in it, it has an overview of the kinds of things I talked about tonight, and it has four case studies that unpack the scripture with respect to a, an example of maintaining, transforming, annulling, and extending. And you can see me, how I'm using the text, how I'm wrestling in order to just model the type of thinking that I'm trying to encourage us to use. Will you join me in thanking God for Dr. Drosius serving us tonight?